Okay. Um, so I think that the biggest uh, pain about trying to switch to Linux for most people is Microsoft Office. LibreOffice is pretty good. Uh, use it when you have to, but sometimes you're dealing with Word documents, you need Microsoft Office. You can actually, oh, I have done this with it. You can actually get Microsoft Office running on Linux. I haven't run it in a while, but hopefully it comes up. In the meantime, the way you do this is through a program called Wine. Um, it basically transfer, it translates commands that a program would send to Windows into what Linux wants to hear and goes back and forth. Um, so to install Microsoft Office on Linux, you still need to pay for Office and have a CDA with the CD key, but you can... Or you can get it from a CU yeah. computer. Yeah, so if you have the CD, you can put it into the computer and try to do this. So here we go. I'm running Linux. There's no Windows on this computer. Here's Office. That's the proof. It works just fine. Uh, every now and then there can be a little bit of a bug, but uh, PowerPoint, Excel, or OneNote maybe even, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so to do this, you would go to um, the Wine website, and they have this application database. And it's just a, a list of things that run well under Wine and don't run well under Wine. Um, I've set up StarCraft for my brother under Wine. Uh, so, you know, uh, StarCraft 2 apparently runs really well. Um, and you would just come in here and search for uh, Microsoft Office. And And there's some a whole bunch of, uh, I guess, reports from people that have tried to install it with various versions of Wine on various distributions. Um, I just I happen to know that it runs well. And then, um, or at least 2007 runs well. I don't know about the other ones. Uh, and then there'll be some, some basic instructions about what you might want to do, um, like a few quirks that you need to do for, for Office. Um, if you're on the other end and you need to run something in, well, let me, let me go back. First of all, so what Wine does is it takes an actual compiled Windows program and um, lets you run it on Linux. Now on Windows, there's this thing called Sigwin, which if you need to run something for Linux on Windows, you can use Sigwin. It's a little bit of a different concept, but um, I have no way of really demoing it for you. Uh, you would need it if you wanted to run something like rsync on Windows. Uh, you would need a Sigwin version of rsync. Um, so before I go on, is there any other thing that you want to know how to do on Linux that you don't, or you want to know how to do on Linux that you can do on Windows and you want to switch? Yeah. I just thought of this one. I assume it's probably less of a concern for Linux, but virus and malware protection. I mean, I assume with all of the Android coming out, it's be it may become more of an issue. Okay, so there are proof of concept of viruses for Linux, <laughs> but it's not really an issue. One of the, I think one of the main reasons why viruses are such an issue on Windows is because by default, the permissions are, very, are not very restrictive. So a virus can go and um, affect other programs while it's running because everybody can modify everything. On Linux, you're running as your own user, and the files are all owned by the root user. So a virus is not easily going to be able to, to um, what's the term? propagate itself into other programs. Um, the other thing is, on Linux, you generally get your software from the distribution. So it's all kind of maintained and combed through. Um, so you're not going to you know, go to some sketchy website and say, oh, this looks cool, download it and install it. So um, that's not an issue. Andy really has more to say on the topic. So I'm um, standing here that, like, yeah. expectantly. Um, so the thing to add, the only thing I would add to that is, I, I guess, twofold. Yes, there are antivirus programs for Linux. Um, things like AVG will run on when they have a Linux version. There are... So AVG is still closed source, but there are fully free, so free open source antivirus stuff. If you go to that Google software store and search for antivirus, there's a whole set of things. Uh, 
no one really uses them for two reasons. One, antivirus software in general is snake oil. It doesn't ever really work well, even on Windows, uh, as noted by the fact that most viruses still propagate. The biggest problem with antivirus software is it can only catch the problem after it's already occurred. Like, it's not preemptive. So all an antivirus software does is keep you from catching last year's viruses. It doesn't keep you from catching the latest and greatest virus because they can't, by the time the virus is, by the time they know the virus exists, you already have it. Uh, the better approach tends to be being careful what you download or running a good firewall um, and stuff. And Windows, Linux does have way better security in that aspect than Windows does. So if you want an antivirus scanner, you can get them for Linux. They don't really work well on any operating system. Linux makes up for this because it has a lot of better security features that prevent viruses from being able to spawn in the first place. Yeah, the, the big antivirus for Linux is called Clan AD, but it's really not for Linux. It's for if you're running a mail server on Linux and you want to scan for Windows viruses, so they you know you help out the Windows users. So yeah, I, nobody runs a, a virus scanner. It's just but you do run good. I mean, you're, 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 it's not to say you don't. You're, you're very careful with security on Linux, but it's different ways. You have a good firewall that locks down anything you're not using. Uh, you have a good user permission system that makes sure no one has the right to change anything that they shouldn't have. Um, you have good monitoring software to detect when something weird is happening and email you about it. I mean, Linux in general is a far more secure environment than Windows. It just doesn't get there via antivirus software, which is kind of a, you've already thrown out, I mean, sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater kind of solution. It's like quality control versus quality assurance, right? Quality control is that after you get all these products, you look at them all and say, these are good. Quality assurance is like from the start of the good stuff. Um, yeah. So, what else? Um, I'll do uh, I'll do VPNs. Um, most uh, businesses and the campus is running a, a flavor of, there's a few different flavor of VPNs. Um, to connect to the campus VPN, it's called uh, Cisco VPN client. Um, the campus has, if you search like Colorado VPN, it'll take you to the IT site. Um, and it'll give you a little installer to install the config. I don't recommend actually doing that. I recommend using Network Manager. Um, first, you need to install the uh, VPN C plugin for Network Manager, and it's probably going to be going to call. I mean, I watched the other I mean, on my. For me, it's called Network Manager VPNC, and then it'll automatically install the actual VPN client. Um, it's probably about the same on Ubuntu. And when you're connecting to a Cisco VPN, there's uh, five things you need to know. You need to know the, the server, you need to know your username and password, and then there's also a group username and password. Um, I don't know why, but the school has like four different VPN setups depending on where you are. Um, one is if you're VPNing to campus and you're already on campus, one is for family housing, one is for residence halls, and one is for if you're off campus. Uh, that's kind of a sketchy design choice in my opinion. However, I just set up the off campus one and it works just fine on campus. So, I should probably, let me just make sure that my password doesn't show. <laughs> Perfect, okay. So to set up the VPN for campus, they don't have a host name, it's an IP address. It's your identity uh, username, your identity password, uh, the group name is CU Boulder, and the group password I will tell you when we turn the camera off. Um, the f if you do it by downloading the installer they give you and they say run as root, I don't like it because it puts files all over your computer and you won't ever be able to get them off because you don't know where they went. Um, it's got an encrypted form of this group password in it, and uh, I just figured out what it was, so I'll tell you what it is when we, when we turn it and that's basically what you need to know for, for VPN because as far as I've seen, every every business uses Cisco VPN, so you can use the Cisco VPN client. There's another thing called OpenVPN. Um, if you want, if you ever have to use that, um, I do the same thing again. Hold on.
there's a different set of things that you need to know for OpenVPN. Um, and usually what you wind up needing to get is a certificate from whomever is administrating the VPN. So you're going to need a few different certificate files, and you can set them up. And like Cisco VPN, you just need the host name. Okay? And if you ever want to set up your, your own VPN, uh, OpenVPN is what you want to use. It's a little bit scary at first, but I actually found it's pretty easy. So I have one set up in New Jersey at my parents' house, and I use it somewhat regularly. So it's a, it's a nice to have. And you can, set, uh, you can do VPN in two ways. One, where if you connect, all of your traffic goes through the VPN. And you can also set it up so it just joins the network. So if you need something that's on the other side of the VPN, you can use it. But your basic browsing and stuff still goes out unencrypted to the internet, just like it would if you weren't connected. OK. Um, if you're installing Linux to your, uh, your laptop or desktop, um, there's a few different couple of things you need to know. Um, the, the most basic and the first thing you need is partitioning. Um, when you install Ubuntu or whatever distribution you want to use, it's going to come up with an installer. The easiest is if you're installing to the entire disk and you don't have Windows there and you don't have anything else you care about. Um, generally, it will pick the right choices for you and install it just fine. Um, I don't know, does the Ubuntu installer work with have Windows installed? Yes, it will automatically shrink your Windows partition and make them do it. So, okay. um, if you want to or have to play around with partitioning, um, I guess I'll explain it a little bit. Can you move the first little thing? Yeah. So generally, on a Linux computer, uh, you divide your hard drive into partitions. You probably do it on Windows too, but maybe you just have one giant partition. Uh, Linux, you're going to need a few partitions. Um, this is my partition table. I have a boot partition, which contains my bootloader, and uh, a few things needed to kind of get the system up and running. Uh, I need. You don't necessarily need this, but if you want to run full disk encryption, which you can do on Linux very easily, um, I have full disk encryption running. You need kind of like an unencrypted um, nugget of information to, to tell the computer how to decrypt the rest of the uh, the rest of the system. Um, so, if you're installing, the easiest thing is to have one giant partition. If you have Windows installed, I hope Ubuntu does it right for you and figures out what's where and sets up the bootloader. If not, um, you'll have to send us an email and we'll figure it out together because. That's, Ubuntu is pretty good. I've never done it before. Um, if you want to dual, so this laptop is actually dual booted. It has Windows for the rare times I need it, and Ubuntu on it. Um, without getting too technical, I mean, there's good tutorials online for how to do this, and anymore, the installer is pretty good at just making it work automatically. Uh, but the easiest way to do it is you know you want to dual boot your laptop when you're you you just reinstall both Windows and Ubuntu at the same time. Because uh, then you can kind of build your partitions in advance and say Windows goes over here, Ubuntu goes over here. If you already have Windows installed and you don't want to reinstall it, you just want to add Linux, Ubuntu will go and basically say, all right, Windows, you get less space, and I'll insert myself over here. That used to be, I mean, any time before you do this, especially, if you, so if you have Windows already installed and you're going to do this, make sure your files are backed up first. Um, it works 99.5% of the time, but if you don't back up, you'll be in that other 0.5% where it screws something up and you lose all your Windows files. Uh, if you just install both Windows and this at the same time, that's not a concern because you're just not trying to manipulate an already done Windows install. Um, but there are good tutorials out there if you just Google installing Ubuntu with Windows or dual booting uh, Ubuntu and Windows. It actually uses Grub by default. So Grub then has a Windows entry that you then chain loans the Windows boot yeah. You can do it the other way. I've actually. Yeah, from seven onwards. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it, there, there's some, you basically, as soon as you boot the computer, you'll get a little options menu that says what operating system do you want to boot, and you can then select between Ubuntu and Windows, or between any 
number of operating systems. Um, the rise of virtual machines has made it a little bit, dual booting used to be the only way you could use both Windows and Ubuntu. Virtual machines have gotten so easy that it's easy to just have a Windows install and use Ubuntu in a virtual machine, or even better, just have a Linux install and only use Windows in a virtual machine for the rare times you need it. Uh, but dual booting is still done, or you can just install all in one. Uh, wait, I know that. Uh, thanks. Um, with your encryption there, I don't know what program you're using, but I use TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt in Windows? Uh, so TrueCrypt, I think you can do, I don't know if you can do full disk encryption in Linux. You might be able to. Okay, I, we, I know you can't Windows, but I was just wondering how hard is that to set up versus in Windows TrueCrypt, it's really easy. It uh, just takes a long time. When you're no, I, I don't know what the Ubuntu installer will do. So it's easy. The Ubuntu installer has a checkbox that says turn on full disk encryption. It deals with it all. Oh, okay. yeah. And it's generally, full disk encryption is going to be a lot faster than um, like home directory encryption, which Ubuntu will also yeah, do. Yeah, Ubuntu will do that also. If you want. Yeah. Um, but if you're, it's just you, do full disk, it's actually there's almost no overhead. Yeah, I did it for like a year and then I had to undo it. Yeah, and it, so you don't really want to, you, you can use TrueCrypt, but the um, it's actually like a suite of things, but uh, the program's called Crypt Setup, and the oh, style so is like a major one. It's called Looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Built into the kernel. Um, okay. Can you install Windows and Ubuntu? Uh, use virtual machine to access the, the physical disk? Uh, no, you Windows? don't, that, that's too, no, you can, um, so if you're on Linux and you have a Windows partition or hard disk, uh, there's an NTFS driver and a FAT, VFAT driver, uh, those are the two Windows file systems to access it, so you would just set up, Ubuntu will probably just let, like, see the disk and let you double click it or whatever and mount it and everything. On the other end, um, I think you can actually mount some Linux file systems on Windows, but you need a third-party tool to do it. Pretty sketchy. Well, there, and I've used an X3 driver on Windows, but generally don't. If you if you want to share data, leave them on a Windows uh, disk like, that uses NTFS or FAT and get it from Linux. You well, don't need the virtual. What well, was that I need to run, let's say, a program in Windows? Uh, and I already have a physical Windows drive. Uh, that is there a way to access that physical uh, drive and so. run it as a virtual machine? I mean, not really. You might be able to. You can capture your drive and turn it into a virtual machine. Yeah. So you can basically take your, if you have an existing physical Windows install, you can kind of convert it to a virtual machine. It basically involves imaging your hard disk and converting it to a virtual machine format. And then you can just boot it in a virtual machine. So that is done. Um, the times that comes in handy, so the only times I've had to really do that is someone at some company has some Windows 95 machine that runs some model they wrote and whoever actually understood how it worked is long since mm -hmm. gone and they don't ever want to touch it again. So we just image the old Windows 95 machine, turn it into a virtual machine, stick it on the server somewhere so you don't have that old piece of hardware just sitting around. Uh, but you can, it can be done. Um, if you need to just run a single program, it's often, I mean, that would be a good application for Wine. Uh, if it works well with Wine, um, if it doesn't, then yeah, I mean, then I would I would just have Linux and then have a Windows VM on top. Of it. And the, the uh, VirtualBox has uh, excuse me has this thing called seamless mode, which will actually instead of keeping a desktop that all your Windows your Windows windows are in, um, it'll break them out and kind of draw them all separately, so you can drag them around and interact with them just like they're running natively, but they're actually being served by the virtual machine. So that would, that, that's kind of what you're, so if you just want to run one application, it makes it look like it's running in Linux, but it's actually running in a virtual machine behind the scenes. Um, so there are some tricks to doing stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I just bought a uh, desktop and uh, I use the sun drive. It's, there's something called the u -boot -in. Yeah. And you uh, install the Ubuntu in the desktop and then re -ease. Uh, and it reads all the previous windows. And it seems like every time I boot the desktop, I have to plug in the thumb drive. Is it necessary? You installed? Yeah, I installed that in onto my desktop, but every time I boot my desktop, I need a thumb drive. That doesn't I've never used it no. before. Um, no, right. Right, so I'm oh. um, it's kind of something so like the key. You used 
you, I think it's UNET boot in or U boot in to, yeah, yeah. to generate the thumb drive, and you install the Ubuntu yes. from the thumb drive, and now you need your thumb drive to boot. Yes. Is that what you're saying? That's what I was saying. Doesn't mm -hmm. sound right. Oh, okay. like BIOS thing, right? What? If you stick the thumb drive, I don't drive know. Like Maybe the boot loader didn't get installed, so it has to boot from the. I don't know. We can talk. Yeah, I grab us after class. That's right. Okay. Specific. And over here. Yeah, why don't you have a swap partition? Okay, so I was actually going to bring that up. I have 8 gigs of RAM on here. If you have more than like 2 gigs of RAM, you really don't need swap. This is actually a debatable point. Yeah, um, I don't, so I just had to redo my laptop because I messed it up. And I used to have a 1 gig swap drive, but I was thinking about it, and I have 8 gigs of RAM. If I run out of RAM, is 1 gig of disk space really going to help me that much? I, I don't think so. Um, you, and there's two ways to do swap. You can have swap partition, you can also have a swap file. So I figured if I ever need swap in the future, I can just create a swap file on my main drive, and the performance is the same. Um, so I wouldn't but like if Hibernate ever worked again or something, doesn't it have to use that? Well, so I think you can use Hibernate with full disk encryption, but I don't know how and I don't need it. I, suspend works. I don't have swap. I do suspend, and I have full disk encryption. Um, I'm not really sure about Hibernate. In Windows, you can hibernate full disk Yeah, I, I think you can, but you need to. Um, not positive. The way I used to have it was I had a swap partition, and it was randomly encrypted on every boot, um, and so that prevented me from hibernating. But I've also never wanted to hibernate, so it's kind of broken. Yeah, I mean it's. It's quickly disappeared. I mean, the low power processor states have gotten so good that the difference between high, I mean, unless you want it to come back a week later, I mean, the difference between hibernating and suspending is negligible anymore. But, um, yeah, I, I would recommend, and Andy's going to disagree with me now, don't don't do that. Don't worry about a swap partition. If, Ubuntu, if Ubuntu does it for you by default, that's fine. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the thumb drive. Yeah. Um, so you said that you have a thumb drive that you can use for swap partition. Yes. Do you have a thumb so I'm still old school, and I always build swap partitions to match my physical memory size, um, just because, I don't know, that's what I've always done. Uh, and that is still what's recommended, especially, so I have servers with 32 gigs of RAM, and I still have a 32 gig swap partition. Um, I like the symmetry, maybe, I don't know. Does it ever use, so Linux has a parameter called swappiness that basically just, it's a number you set from 0 to 100, and it tells the operating system how aggressively to swap. I've never ever seen it. Anytime I use a machine with more than eight gigs of RAM, I've never seen it write anything to the swap partition. But I still put them there because hard disk space is cheap. I mean, at least does, it, does everybody know what we're talking about? What swapping is when you run out of memory. Yeah. And, okay. So it's just ex swapping is extending your RAM with space on your hard disk. Yeah. So it's really you generally don't want to use swap because your hard disk is way slower than RAM. Uh, so the less you can avoid it, the better. Having no swap file is the brute force way of avoiding it, right? So you can't possibly do it. Um, the downside is Matt's computer will crash if he somehow manages to fill up that 8 gigs of RAM. Uh, but uh, does it actually help when you have like uh, 500 gigs of uh, hard disk and like 2 or 3 gigs of RAM? Uh, swapping the RAM for hard disk, does it actually make a difference? Yes, it keeps your computer from crashing. Uh, so it's going to get really slow. But if you only have two gigs of RAM and you open enough windows to fill it up, you're just going to die. I mean, the operating system has no way of handling that at that point. Um, so it's based. So if you have less than eight gigs of RAM, you probably still want to swap space. Two years from now, that'll be 16 gigs of RAM because programmers keep writing more and more bloated code, right? And take advantage of what's given to them. But what was um, the rule of thumb? It was half the RAM or twice as much RAM. So the old rule of thumb used to be twice. The new rule of thumb is match the amount of RAM. So the other reason why there's still, especially on a server, maybe a benefit to matching, to having a swap partition that matches your RAM space is sometimes you want to swap something out even if you don't need to, just because you know you're not going to need it for a long time. And Linux can do a nice one-to-one -one mapping of RAM to swap space. If they have the same size, then it just basically then has the ability to just pull something out that it knows it's not going to need, and you'll never even see it. But Matt's approach is fine on a desktop. But, I mean, even still, I just don't like the inflexibility of having a swap partition. And if I feel like I need a swap file because Andy convinces me, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just do a file. And it works just the same. Partition's faster than a file. But it's not. It's the same speed because uh, <laughs> the, the swap uh, module in Linux uh, takes the file and operates it on the block right. level. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I shouldn't be doing swap partitions anymore, but I still use it. Um, 
I guess turn it to a two-part question. Does that wreck your encryption if you have a swap file? And um, No, so you can encrypt the swap. Well, first of all, if you have a swap file, it's encrypted because it's on a disk that's already encrypted. If you have a swap partition, what you can do is use uh, a random password when you boot, so you don't need it when you reboot. So the swap partition will be encrypted. Um, some people do have a fixed password, and so they have to enter two passwords when they boot their computer. I see no point to that. Just use a random. Okay. And uh, another question was, um, when we get an SSD drive, and I heard there's something you could do to not wreck it in like a year. So there's a thing called trim, and our discard commands. I, I don't well, know what's what. Let's talk about how it accesses it, accesses it, and I can wear it out. Well, so the defaults in Linux will handle that pretty well anymore. Uh, uh, I think if you using, using the XT4. I think you should. I think you should mount with the SSD option for SSD for uh, X4 for B3FS. It, it, the default is to be friendly to an SSD or detect an SSD for X4. I think you need to give it an option to mount. And if you're using encryption, you need to in, um, map the encrypted volume with the discard support, and that'll let the operating system tell the firmware on the SSD that it doesn't need the block anymore, so it can um, allocate it randomly. But yeah. it's quickly, having to do anything special is quickly disappearing. A lot of these things happen for you automatically. Yeah, I probably won't do both those things at once, but I was just wondering. I saw another one. Somebody else had a question? Yep. OK, uh, so that's pretty much all we have. Um, what about the VPN information? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you we'll, the, I'll tell Let's switch the camera off. Um, Matt and I are reachable via email if you guys have follow-up questions in the coming days or weeks or run into issues with something down the road. The man pages are your friend. Google's your friend. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Stack Overflow. It's more of a programming site than anything else, but it's, um, there is an equivalent to it that isn't for programming questions. It's for operating system questions called SuperUser. Uh, it's a great place to ask questions. Uh, it's like a voted up form format. So like a form, but the best answer gets voted up, so it becomes very easy to see what the best answer to any given question is. Um, so that's superuser.com probably, it could be .org. Um, but look at that if you have a question that you can't figure out on your own. The only rule to using superuser or any of the Stack Overflow websites of which it's one is make sure you search for your question first, because you will get mercilessly flamed if you ask a question that three other people have already asked. The moderators do not take kindly to that in those communities. Uh, but SuperUser is a great community if you need to get help on something and if you can't, you've done your due diligence and you still can't find an answer. We'll stick around if people have one-on-one -on -one questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll probably send out a survey here when I send out the videos for this. We'd appreciate if you guys fill it out just so if we teach this again at some point, we know what to change, what works, what doesn't. Um, we've touched a very small subset of what Linux is because that's all you can touch in six weeks. but. Hopefully this gives you the starting knowledge you know to kind of go and figure out the rest on your own. Or email Matt and I, and we'll write you lengthy and arguing responses on, uh, on whatever you're asking about. All right, thanks a lot, guys.